going to start, <clears throat> just remember that uh, in terms of reaching us, we always prefer that you use the email. I will share the email again at the end, which is support at aquatraining.com. Mm -hmm. uh, for today's session, we are looking at uh, common side effects uh, of antiretroviral medications. We are unfortunately not going to be able to cover all side effects, but we are just covering what I would call a serious side effects that generally would require some form of medical intervention. So I'm hoping that um, if you do have specific questions um, towards the end of the session, you may ask. At this point in time, I'm going to switch off my video because of uh, network issues and bandwidth from uh, some of you. Uh, but feel free to notify me at any given time should you have uh, specific questions. We will have some time at the end of the session for questions and probably to look at at least one case. So we'll cover anemia, um, lipo, dystrophy, hyper, I mean hepatotoxicity, rash, abacave associated um, toxicity, tenofove, um, renal toxicity, and also efavirenz um, toxicity. So remember there are, ARVs are classified um, in classes. We've got what we call your nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These would include drugs like zidovudine, abacave, lamivudine, and emtricitabine. So when you deal with side effects, it's uh, equally important for you to know the drugs because when a patient presents and they have a certain clinical problem, you are likely to be able to help them and switch the correct drug if you are able to associate that complaint or side effect to a specific drug. So if you look at zidovudine, it might give you, you know, nail discoloration, nausea, but anemia is the commonest presenting, you know, um, side effect, uh, which we need to pay attention to. Abacave does give a hypersensitivity reaction where patients can present with fever, rash, fatigue, um, you know, and these are generally non-specific. So it's more of a side effect that you suspect. And as soon as you suspect that side effect, you would probably act on it and then you take it from there. Lamivudine is one of our best or well-tolerated uh, drugs, very minimal side effect uh, profile together with emtricitabine. Though with emtricitabine, you might get sometimes hyperpigmentation of the palms um, and soles. Um, these are some of the NRTIs. Stavudine, we no longer use. Didodesine, we no longer use in the South African guidelines. So you don't, these were very good drugs, you know, very effective. But unfortunately, these two drugs had a very bad um, side effect profile. So we, they are no longer used in South Africa. And they were replaced by a drug called Tenofove, um, which uh, is quite safe. Um, but in patients who have pre-existing um, kidney problems or renal problems, they might present with nephrotoxicity, um, um, GI upset, um, and then also flatulence. And I think it's quite important that whenever we deal with side effects, we, we, we also deal with minor side effects. You know, something like flatulence might not kill a patient, you know, it might not be clinically significant, but to a patient, this might be important. And if that side effect has a risk of leading to poor adherence, then it is a side effect that we want to pay attention to. Now, um, remember now there's a second class of drugs that we call your nucleoside, I mean your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, mainly efavirenz and neverapine, um, which are commonly used in our context. And some of the common um, adverse effects would include rash, um, an increase in liver enzymes, and then uh, hepatotoxicity, which is damage to the liver cells. So it's very important that when you have a patient who presents with rash and they're taking some of these drugs, then you might consider that one of these drugs might be causing the rash. Remember, it is a class side effect. That means all your NNRTIs are likely to give you rash. However, neverapine is the culprit uh, more than, you know, efavirenz, right? 
So again, another class is what we call your protease inhibitors. And the blue ones are the ones that we generally use. So you've got atazanavir, you've got lopinavir, ritonavir, which is the commonly used protease inhibitor in South Africa. Um, and you can see some of the side effects include nausea. And I think the diarrhea here is very important because the majority of patients would really complain of a watery diarrhea that, that, that does not have uh, blood or even mucus, so it's just a watery diarrhea. We should not keep patients, you know, with this diarrhea for years. Whenever a patient is not coping with these drugs, especially lopinavir, ritonavir, we would rather opt to use a drug like um, atazanavir, which does not necessarily have these. Um, lopinavir, ritonavir can also lead to uh, metabolic um, um, kind of side effects, including your high cholesterol, um, insulin resistance, where patients can present with high sugar, uh, diabetes, um, and also um, some uh, body disfigurement or body changes, which I will discuss with you um, shortly. Right. So let's start now with hematological. So what kind of uh, problems can we uh, get from the drugs or which drugs might lead to hematological or blood problems. Um, so zidovudine, which is traditionally known as AZT, may cause anemia, right? A low HB. Um, but what is important is that more than half the time when patients are anemic, they would also have a, some reduction in the white cell count, right? And when you look at the size of the cells, right? When you look at your full blood count results, you would have a low HB showing you that you have anemia. Just below that, there's what we call MCV, V for volume. So this uh, um, a blood test measures the size of the cells. So your MCV would be elevated or high. So you've got an anemia that is associate, associated with a big um, um, red cells. We call them megaloblasts right? So that is the type of anemia that's caused by AZT. It is very rare to get a low HB from zidovudine with an MCV. That is normal, right? So always check. If you find low anemia um, with an MCV that is high on a patient who has recently started on zidovudine, you may consider that that is a AZT-associated um, anemia, right? And hence, whenever we start patients on zidovudine, you have to do your HB before you start them on ARVs. You have to do it monthly for the first three months. And if it's okay, then you do it once a year uh, from then onwards. Um, risk factors is that patients who start ARVs when they are significantly immunosuppressed, patients who are taking other drugs that are likely to suppress the bone marrow, you know, uh, drugs like uh, cotrimoxazole, amphotericin B, these are drugs that we generally use to treat some of the HIV-associated um, conditions. Um, in that instance, we might consider avoiding the use of zidovudine or monitoring those patients uh, very closely, right? So again, zidovudine can give you hyperpigmented nails. So you remember I said the side effects that are not clinically significant because they might not cause harm to the patient, but uh, women with dark nails might not be happy and they might you know, decide not to take drugs because of that. Anemia, we talk about pala, where you ask your patient to open his or her mouth, you look at the tongue or the eyes, you look at the sclera, you can see that the patient is pale or even the palms are just pure white, right? And that is what we call pala in the context of anemia. So the, the anemia that you get from zidovudine generally happens very early. So within the first month after starting your patient on a regimen that has zidovudine, they might present with anemia, which is a low HB, right? Usually macrocytic. Remember I said it's anemia associated with big uh, red blood cells. And how will you see it? When you do your full blood count just below the HB test, you'll see MCV, V for volume, the size of the cell, and that test would be high. Then you might consider that this is due to AZT, right? So what is important is this part here, to say anyone where you suspect that they have zidovudine associated um, anemia, check their HB, 
if the HB is less than seven, you have to stop um, Zidovudin and then replace it with Tenofovir, right? Obviously, as to what you are going to replace it with, it is also determined by the drug history of that patient. If you are dealing with a patient who had failed Tenofovir before, you might then maybe opt to switch them from Zidovudin to Abacavir um, as necessary, right? Then you repeat um, your, o your HB in a week. Hopefully it has improved and uh, you may continue from that. If it has not improved, you might need to investigate you know, um, other things. Just remember that we don't treat blood tests. So even if the HB is eight, but the patient is decompensating, they have dizzy spells, they have collapsed, their heart rate is very fast, so that patient is not coping, right? Clinically is not coping. We, will, we might need to switch them and also consider blood transfusion uh, before we lose um, that particular patient, right? So that is it uh, around the anemia associated um, with uh, um, Zidovudin. Now, the other um, condition is what we call lipodystrophy. So lipo means fat, dystrophy means abnormal distribution of fat. And we basically have two kinds. So you've got lipodystrophy as a bigger uh, condition, which has got two kinds. You've got fat accumulation, which we call lipohypertrophy, right? Hyper. So the patient is gaining fat. Um, in certain areas of their, their body. Generally, it's central obesity, um, where the abdomen, the upper back, and the breast, you know, they gain fat a, a, a along those um, areas. But when you look at their limbs, which is the hands and the, uh, I mean, the, yes, the hands and the legs, you find that they are thin. So if you think of Humpty Dumpty, um, when we grew up, uh, he was uh, more obese centrally, uh, with uh, a thinning of the limbs. So this is associated generally with protease inhibitors. So it's very important. If a patient presents with body disfigurement, you need to ask yourself, are you having fat loss or fat gain, right? So if there is fat accumulation or fat gain, you associate it with your protease inhibitors and sometimes your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, sometimes, you know, efavirenz can cause um, a similar um, condition. Just remember that sometimes when it happens, patients would have a high cholesterol, you know, sometimes they, they get hypertensive insulin resistance where they have a high glucose and then abdominal obesity. So obviously this combination is a bad combination for cardiovascular um, diseases, right? And the risk factors are when you start patients who were obese before starting ARVs, uh, those who start ARVs when they are old, and those with very uh, low CD4 counts um, when they started ARVs, right? Then we've got what we call lipoatrophy. So where there is now loss of fat, generally around the face, the buttocks, and the extremities. So the legs and, and the arms and hands, right? Um, and this is generally linked to your NRTIs. Stavudine and DDI being the most uh, problematic drugs, but luckily by God's grace, we no longer use these two drugs. Therefore, Zidovudine uh, will be the most problematic drug. Tenofove can still give you the same and Abacave. Obviously, Abacave being the safest, but that doesn't mean if a patient is taking Abacave, they cannot develop um, lipoatrophy or fat loss, right? So this is an example where you now appreciate that you are able to see, for example, the lens, you're able to see some of the facial muscles, right? Your obicularis oris, you know, a new dimple in an adult because they have lost fat um, under the skin. So just after the skin, it's muscles, the fat is gone. So that is what we call, you know, um, lipo atrophy. So the fat is gone, you are left with muscles um, and the skin. And this is associated with your NRTIs, but particularly Zidovudin, Tenofove, and uh, sometimes um, Abacave to a lesser extent, right? This is now central obesity. Remember we said if you get lipohypertrophy or fat gain, generally uh, centrally around the abdomen, the breasts, and then the upper back, like a buffalo hump, 
um, of some sort, as you can see it um, in this uh, uh, instance. So, so it is lipodystrophy. You either have lipoatrophy, where you lose fat, or lipohypertrophy in this instance, where you gain fat. And if it's fat gain, you are thinking lopinavir, ritonavir, and sometimes um, efavirenz might be causing um, the same. Again, lipoatrophy, we said the extremities, which is the legs, you can see nicely the calf muscles and the veins, you know, you can really draw them. So that means the fat that is supposed to be covering those tissues is gone. So this is lipoatrophy. If you look at the females who come and say, my calves, you know, are no longer there. Actually, I have a dimple around my buttocks. Um, so, and this is a mixed one, right? Because you can see a dimple there. But centrally, it seems like there is some level of central um, obesity and then the thinning of the extremities. So this would be a mixed uh, picture um, kind of um, a condition, right? So how do you manage this? Well, the first thing is to make sure that you are able to differentiate wasting from lipodystrophy, right? Because with wasting, a patient is losing both fat and muscles. These are very sick patients, sometimes due to AIDS itself or even other opportunistic infections like TB, uh, chronic diarrhea, you know. And so, so here we're talking about a very sick uh, uh, patient. Lipodystrophy generally happens on patients who are stable, who are on ARVs for a while, specifically your NRTIs. And it can either be fat loss or fat gain, right? If it, if it is fat loss, you know the problems are with your NRTIs. Obviously, your D drugs, which we no longer use, are a problem, but Zidovudine is a problem. And the best option is if they are taking Zidovudine, where possible, you'll switch them to Tenofovir or even um, Abacavir. Remember, patients who are taking Tenofovir can still present with lipoatrophy, and we might need to consider Abacavir. However, it is not common um, with these two drugs, right? More common with Zidovudine than these two drugs fat loss. Then fat gain is associated with both your PIs, which is your lopinavir, ritonavir, and efavirenz sometimes. There is no, the, you know, the switching here is very difficult, but because now we have a third drug that we can use, um, if you suspect any of these drugs to be causing fat gain, you might then consider dolutegravir as an alternate drug but uh, you also have to advise on diet and exercise because even dolutegravir, um, there are reports of excessive weight, weight gain um, with that specific drug. No, though not necessarily in a, in a, in a, in a way that changes one's uh, body shape, right? So quite important. Just remember that lipohypertrophy for fat gain, you also need to check your patient's blood sugar, check their BP, and also check the cholesterol levels because uh, it sometimes it comes as a, as a syndrome uh, where you've got the fat gain, hypertension, diabetes, and the high cholesterol in the blood. Right. So the next condition is this uh, yellow eyes, uh, yellow discoloration of the sclera or the eyes. Um, and, and we would call this jaundice. And this means now we are dealing with a patient who has a problem somewhere in the liver um, um, where they would uh, then um, need assistance, right? So what is very important is to know that most ARVs do cause some level of uh, liver toxicity. That's very important. Actually, there's no class of drugs that does not cause liver toxicity. It's just that some drugs uh, cause a bigger problem uh, than the other drugs. What is very important is to always remember when you have uh, drugs that cause liver toxicity, you always have to do your liver function test. And there's just two tests really that you need to look at on your liver function test is your ALT, which generally tells us that the liver cells are being destroyed. And then your ALP, which generally tells us that something is growing on the liver and we need to look at that liver, right? So in other words, if a patient presents with yellow eyes like that patient, uh, one, you might need to refer as a sister, but if uh, it's a mild uh, um, condition, then you'll do your liver function test and it will give you some guidance. So generally, if your ALP is normal, it means 
whatever problem is going on, it's got nothing to do with things growing on the liver. Things that can grow on the liver is things like uh, cancers, tumors, cysts, you know, uh, granulomas and abscesses and so on. Here we're talking about medical side of things. So if a patient is abusing alcohol, your ALT might be high. If they've got the hepatitis B, your ALT might be high. If they are using traditional medicines, right, your, your ALT uh, might be high. So depending on the level of your ALT, right, you need to act in a certain way. So if your ALT is less than 100, so grade one is more than NIMART group of patients that you can manage. Um, um, at the NIMART level as a nurse without necessarily asking a doctor a lot of questions. So if the ALT comes back and it's 80, you, you, you investigate your patient, you take blood for hepatitis B, you assess use or abuse of alcohol, uh, traditional medicines, other drugs that the patient might be taking, and then you monitor your patient, right? But if the HB if your ALT, sorry, is 80 and the patient is symptomatic, they have a yellow eyes or they have a abdominal pains on the right upper side, right upper quadrant, right? You need to stop all the drugs and refer. So this, this part here is important. All it tells us is that if you are dealing with a symptomatic patient, you disregard the levels, right? At the primary healthcare level, you need to refer your patient, right? You're not going to have a patient who's got an ALT of 80 and they're jaundiced and you say, no, I'm waiting for the ALT to be 400. The patient will die before we get there. We don't treat test results, we treat patients. So this is a very, 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 very important, right? If a patient does not have symptoms, so they are stable, you are just doing a, your monitoring blood, you did the ALT and the ALT is between 80 and 200, you need to review their drugs. If there's a drug that is known to cause liver toxicity like nevirapine, you just stop that drug, right? Any time you have an ALT that is above 200, you need to refer the patient. 400, you stop all the drugs, you know, and refer. So this is kind of like giving you a sense of how best to, to manage patients based on the different levels of their ALT. But anytime they are symptomatic, you always stop all the drugs and refer your patient. If the ALP is also high, your patient needs a stoner. Why? We need to look. Why? Because ALP tells us that something is growing in the liver. There's something there that's growing, which we need to address, right? So at the NIMARC level, grade one toxicity is what you manage. Grade two, you manage after discussing with your doctor because you need to stop specific liver toxic drugs and give your patient a better regimen. Grade three, grade four, they are beyond the NIMARC scope. All symptomatic patients must be referred all patients with a high ALP must also be referred for a SONA. So that's as simple as that. Who do you refer? All those who are decompensating, who are symptomatic, those who might have a high ALP, and then grade three, grade four. So you will manage any patient who's got an ALT below 100. You'll discuss with a doctor, any patient who's got an ALT between 80 and 200, you would refer all other patients, right? I've repeated it three times. I'm hoping that um, you got it. So just remember in terms of liver injury, you've got two kinds. You either have cellular damage where the cells in the liver are being damaged, then your ALT will be very high, right? or something is growing in the liver, then your ALP would be very high. Remember from the previous graph, as soon as you have a high ALP, what do you do? You refer for SONA, right? So all these uh, issues here, you're not going to deal with them. So it can be a tumor, an abscess, but something or gallstones, as long as the ALP is high from a NIMAR perspective, you refer your patient for a doctor's assessment and for an abdominal sauna. If the ALT is 80, yes, it's high, but then you can be able to assess, is your patient abusing alcohol? Are they taking other drugs, TB drugs, fluconazole, nevirapine, drugs that we use every day that might be destroying the liver? Take blood in a red top for hepatitis B, and then let's wait for the results. Don't forget traditional medicines and other things that people might be taking, which might be causing cellular um, damage. Right, 
I hope you are following. And if there's any questions, uh, write them down and let's discuss. Just remember a very important issue that the uh, people who are living with HIV and AIDS can also have um, what we call hepatitis B uh, virus, right? And uh, and remember, if the patient is taking tenofovir, lamivudine, you know, as part of their regimen, these two drugs would also treat both hep HIV and hepatitis B. That is why you should never interrupt tenofovir unless you know the hepatitis B status of your patient, right? So if they if they do have hepatitis B, you should never stop these two drugs in that regimen because not only are we treating HIV with these two drugs, we are also treating what? Hepatitis B. I think make sure that you, 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 you understand that, but if you need more clarity uh, towards the end, you may ask me um, again. Now, another condition for tonight is what we call rash, right? So rash can be a simple rash or it can be a very horrible rash. And whenever you see a patient with rash, you want to assess whether other systems in the body are affected. Like what? Do they have fever? So if there's rash with fever, that is an urgent rash. You need to stabilize the patient and refer the patient. If a patient has rash, that when you look at it, you feel like running. That means it's a scary rash, right? Irrespective of the description, it means it's a serious rash. So they need to be assessed uh, further. If the rash is affecting the eyes, the mouth, and the genital area, which is the mucosa, you are more worried that it's a Steven Johnson syndrome, and you know the mortality rate is very high when we get um, to such um, conditions. Remember I said earlier, rash belong to the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, mainly efavirenz and nevirapine. Nevirapine being the problematic drug, right? And uh, just also note that there's other drugs like your cotrimoxazole, Bactrim, or even INH, uh, isoniazid, which is part of our TB treatment, which are known to cause um, the same. So it's not always ARVs. That's why when it's very bad, we stop all the drugs without necessarily trying to, to think. So if you find such a rush like this one, you are worried that this might be, you know, Steven Johnson syndrome. And there's a rule about nevirapine and such things, and which is never use nevirapine in females with CD4 counts above 250, right? That is the risk factor for developing a very bad rash, right? In males, we the cutoff is 400. So males with a 400, I mean, with a CD4 count above 400, we want to avoid the use of nevirapine. Um, in those meals. So, so this is quite uh, important, you know. So, and then if the rash now involves the mouth, the genital area, you know, uh, the eyes, it means now it involves the mucosa, then we are in trouble because now we have what we call Steven Johnson syndrome, right? So that is uh, the, the, the most important thing that when you start patients on nevirapine, check their baseline CD4 count, but also when you have started them on nevirapine, every visit, assess rash, assess their eyes for jaundice and then their abdomen for abdominal pains. If a patient has any of those, you need to interrupt nevirapine and consider a favorance. Uh, you know, uh, um, hopefully dolutegravir is the best option because remember, if you switch from nevirapine to a favorance, a favorance can still give you the same issue. So depending on how bad the rash is, a favorance can still be an option, but otherwise I would say, opt for dolutegravir um, rather than uh, drugs from this specific um, class. So, so it generally happens within one month of starting nevirapine, right? And whenever a patient presents with rash, you want to ask them whether they've got blood vision, they've got fever, uh, are there sores in the mouth or genital areas? The source on the skin, are they blistering? You know, like uh, where they, 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 they are losing the, some level of the skin. If the answer to any of this is yes, you need to stop all the drugs and refer your patient. Stabilize the patient and refer them. If the answer is no, it means it's a mild drug. All you need to do is to identify uh, the culprit drug like nevirapine, then stop nevirapine and give a better drug and then give uh, whatever antihistamine uh, allergics and so on as needed. Right, but the most important thing is to add, is to assess whether we are dealing with a bad rash 
or a mild rash. If it is mild, you can still stop one drug and replace that drug. If it is severe, you need to stop all the drugs and refer your patient as soon as yesterday. Right. I hope you are still with me. Um, now, Abacave, we generally use it a lot in South Africa, specifically for the children. It is actually our priority NRTI for, for pediatrics, uh, you know. So it's got the high sensitivity also. And remember, if you have seen the box, they always have a funny warning system there. There's something that you pull out and it says, hey, be careful and patients start asking you um, a lot of questions. So this hypersensitivity reaction is linked to a specific gene, you know, which is common in um, Caucasians or, or, or Europeans or white people. Um, however, in South Africa, because we use a lot of it, we do get time and again uh, get our patients who present with a Bacave hypersensitivity reaction. So how do you know whether a patient is presenting with such? Number one is that you should not be scared of it because when it happens for the first time, it tends not to be very bad, right? So generally it happens within the first six weeks. So number one, it must be a patient who started Abacave in the last six weeks um, or so, right? And they present with either fever, rash, some uh, nausea, vomiting kind of symptoms, body pains, joint pains, um, cough, you know, um, and sore throat. So, so and, and now you can see here, it says, if a patient presents with any two of these complexes, so fever and rash, rash and body pains or a cough, shortness of breath with fever, you'll even think it's COVID-19, eh? <laughs> yeah, you see. So you'll see that with HIV-positive patients, don't just think COVID all the time. Also look at their drugs, especially if their COVID test comes back negative and they started on a Bacave in the last six weeks, you must consider Abacave hypersensitivity. And if you think it is Abacave, then you stop Abacave and you never give it again. Now the trick is on this part, never give it again because it is when you re-challenge or when you restart Abacave on a previously suspected hypersensitivity patient that you cause problems, right? And then obviously if they have only one symptom, fever only or cough only, uh, there's no need. You just continue a backup and monitor your patients very closely. There's another thing that patients will tell you. They will tell you that whatever symptoms they are presenting with, if it's rash and fever, they'll tell you that it gets worse after every dose. So if a patient has started a backup recently, they present with two or more of these, and they tell you that their symptoms get worse with each dose, you're probably dealing with a backup Just stop it. Then your patient will be fine. But the... Uh, make notes in the clinical records, educate the patient to never start that drug again, and uh, they will be safe um, from then onwards. Right. Great stuff. I'm sure this is like a lot of information to cover in an hour, but I'm hoping that you are still following um, 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 and you are with me. Now, tenofovir, I mean, is a drug that we use. It's now part of our standard first-line regimen in South Africa. It's, it's a generally safe drug. Right. The key important thing are one, you need to screen patients for pre-existing renal disease. So make sure that you just do a basic urine dipstick, but also with history. You know, someone's got a history of being admitted for kidney problems, the, someone who is older, you know, and uh, maybe they are diabetic. So you can imagine that they are likely that they already have other kidney problems. And then if a patient is already taking other kidney toxic, nephrotoxic drugs. So those are your patients that you need to monitor very closely that if you start them on tenofovir, they might end up um, with um, some um, kinds of problems, right? So remember patients can get acute renal failure. So if they start tenofovir and they've got kidney problems immediately after that, some patients, they start to have a sugar in urine with a protein in urine. That's why I said you must do a urine dipstick and then some patients just have the inability to reabsorb water and they urinate as frequent, you know, um, <laughs> uh, they just uh, keep on drinking water and, and they go again and pass it out. So what is key is to do what we call your creatinine clearance, right, in these patients. And um, let me see if it's covered. Yes, so remember, before starting patients on tenofovir, you need to do your 
blood test uh, for a creatinine clearance. If it is normal, you continue. You do another one at three months, six months, and then once a year um, from then onwards. A urine dipstick is very important. And the rule is this part here, right? If a creatinine clearance comes back and it is less than 50, right, you should avoid tenofovir and maybe opt for abacavir or even zidovudin, right? So that is the trick. So remember, tenofovir linked with kidney problems. If your creatinine clearance is below 50, avoid um, tenofovir. From a NIMAR perspective, you're not supposed to be managing patients who've got very low creatinine clearances, but I know of many nurses who manage these patients because you refer them to the hospital and then they come back the same way. So what do you do? You decide to stop TDF and give your patient a back of it and their and their kidney, their, their creatinine clearance improves over time and you have helped the patient. So that's where we find ourselves. And I know many uh, nurses who do that um, on a daily basis. Uh, that is the formula for the creatinine clearance. It is not very relevant because the, the lab now calculates for us. So we don't necessarily need to be doing these calculations, but there was a time where we needed to take out our calculators and calculate. So yeah, we don't need to do that anymore. Um, here's another condition which is common where patients take ARVs and they come back with either painful breasts or breasts that are growing in size. And uh, most of the time, unfortunately, it's males. And we call this condition gynecomastia, right? Gynecomastia, right? Which is the hyperproliferation of your lactiferous ducts. So by basically in basic, it means uh, generally in a male patient who comes complaining of breast pains or even breasts that are increasing in size. I think the key message around gynecomastia is don't always think it's the ARV drugs. You know, that is the trick. Where you think it's the drugs or HIV and you don't check other things, that's where you cause problems, right? Remember males during puberty or the growth spurt, like uh, when we turn 12, 13, 14 or so, we do get uh, some level of physiological uh, gynecomastia. Uh, males who've got the low uh, testosterone or their testicles are becoming small, uh, where estrogen now dominates might be an issue. Drugs, you know, look at the drugs here. Uh, that can cause uh, this spironolactone, which is a, a, a diuretic that we use, you know, very commonly. You know, isoniazid from TB treatment, cimetidine for those who've got peptic ulcers, ACE inhibitors, for cardiac patients and those with hypertension, calcium, you know, your, 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 your anabolic steroids, haloperidol. That's why males who inject these steroids, hoping that they will get more muscles, suddenly they lose their testicles and so on. Antipsychotics, antidepressants, you know, anti-epileptic, anti-vomiting drugs. So most of the drugs, marijuana, by the way, can cause the same. So you have to take proper history and do a proper analysis to say, why is my patient having, you know, enlarging breast? So once you have excluded liver problems, you have excluded kidney problems and the thyroid is okay, the testicles are there, good shape, size, it still has a beard and a baritone, you know, then you can say maybe it is a, one of the ARV drugs. And the culprit drug in today's era would be a favorance, right? So then you might say, well, I need to stop this effavirenz, and you'd probably switch your patient if suppressed to dolutegravé, uh, and then you are helping your patient. Just remember, if someone has big breasts, they can't disappear overnight, right? It can't be magic. So you have to uh, counsel your patient and make sure that they understand if the breasts are too huge, refer them to surgery or even to plastic surgery so that they can uh, help them. They do help them. The waiting list might be a bit long, but uh, I have personally sent few. Uh, for for assistance, right? The, the last uh, side effects uh, for tonight are your effavirenz central nervous system side effects, um, which majority of patients, more than half of your patients, will get some form of. After starting effavirenz, they will come back and say, "Ooh, I have t I had terrible dreams, or I couldn't sleep, or you know, uh, the loss of concentration." That's why. We used to say you should not give a favorance to people who use heavy machinery, risky, who work in risky environments, you know, 
So here are the symptoms, dizziness, headaches, inability to maintain sleep, you know, depression. So if someone is already depressed, maybe you want to avoid it if you can. But in our guidelines, we say we avoid the use of efavirenz in patients who have active psychosis. So if someone is a known mental health uh, patient or user and they are diagnosed, they are on treatment, they are stable, you can still use efavirenz. But obviously, you just need to monitor them um, a bit. There's strange dreams. This used to be fun when I used to work in an ARV clinic full time because I used to ask patients, whenever I start them, when they come back after seven days, hey, how are you? Tell me about your dreams. And I tell you, it used to be one part of the consultation that I used to enjoy because you hear all sorts of interesting dreams <laughs> that you wouldn't want to, to dream about, about. And by the way, some patients enjoy these dreams. When you switch them later on to another drug, they come back and say, hey, my dreams are gone. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> quite uh, interesting. And obviously a small percentage develops serious psychiatric uh, symptoms, uh, severe depression with su being suicidal. So if someone is a parasuicide, maybe you want to avoid the use of evaporance, um in that circumstance, right? And then uh, high risk also if they are substance users and with mental health. I'm sure you know that people used to take um, these drugs away from patients and steal them and smoke these drugs because they give you this sense, uh, you know, of a high mood. Just remember that uh, this statement does not hold water anymore. We use efavirenz safely in pregnancy for years and for many pregnant women in South Africa. So efavirenz can be used um, in pregnancy and we do use it and we haven't seen any significant increase in uh, babies born with um, abnormalities, right? So this is the algorithm. It's very complicated, but it's very simple, you know, when you look at it. Number one, it says, before you give a favorites to any patient, screen them for pre-existing psychiatric. So that's principle number one. Before you give a favorite, screen your patient. If you have a patient who's suicidal, you should probably avoid the use of a favorite, right? Then it says number two, what do you need to look for? You need to educate your patient to say, look, it's going to happen. We have seen that more than half of our patients within the first two weeks, they will experience some form of CNS. And if it happens within the first two weeks, we don't become anxious. We know that we were expecting it and then we try to manage our patients as needed, right? So number one, uh, avoid use in patients with pre-existing uh, mental health conditions. Number two, educate your patient. Number three, take it on an empty stomach. This is because Fatty food increases the absorption of efavirenz. Then your patient gets exaggerated side effects. That's principle number three, right? Principle number one, avoid in those who are already uh, uh, um, suicidal or with severe psychiatric um, illness. Number two, educate your patient. Number three, try to, to take it on an empty stomach and at night, right? And, 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 and then sometimes we might need to change the... the when we take it. For example, if a patient says to me, I have insomnia, inability to sleep, I know that generally we take a five at night, but I would generally advise that patient, so you know what, take it in the morning. Because if they take it in the morning, by the time they need to sleep at night, the drug levels are normal, they're not high in the blood, then they are able to, to sleep, right? Someone says, I've got disturbing dreams. Yes, uh, they've got those, but then what is the best thing? Is to maybe say, take it during the day, take it on an empty stomach, right? So, so that by the time you need to sleep at night, the blood levels or, or the drug levels in the blood are lower and you're able to do that, right? Where we cannot um, 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 change the timing, uh, we might need to treat maybe with the other drugs to help people to sleep better. But generally we recommend that if patients are not coping with non-medical treatments, you stop efavirenz and you probably give them something else um, like a dolutegrav. But sometimes you are stuck with efavirenz, then you might need to add other treatments to either manage the dizziness, the poor concentration, you know, the depression. You might need to give antidepressants if, uh, if we don't have a choice. But where we have a choice, we want to avoid the use of efavirenz and then give our patient um, something else, right? Um, yeah, you know, poor concentration is a very important thing. I always talk about the lawyer guy that I saw and he said, doctor, I can't read to the 
I can't speak to the judge anymore. I have to read because my concentration is poor. So he can't, uh, you know, do his uh, um, uh, closing arguments. He, he needs to have a book in front of him and read and stuff. I said, ah, you know what, let's stop this drug. We stopped it. We gave him something else. Ah, he was sorted. So that is uh, the issue. So remember, there are situations where we might need to give a favorance during the day, uh, but generally it's given at night as a daily dose. Right. So in summary, remember, side effects, you won't know about them unless you ask patients. Some patients won't even tell you. So you have to ask if a patient is taking some drugs, like they're taking tenofovir, you have, you have to look, you have to have a checklist. You know, you have to say yeah, every visit, you need to do a urine dipstick if you're on tenofovir, because that's how early we can pick up if there are problems. You have to ask patients how they are doing. You have to look through examination. You need to have a checklist of things that you need to check. And then if a patient has such, then you, 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 you take it from there, right? And remember, like I said, from a NIMAR perspective, you generally manage mild um, side effects. If things start to get worse, um, then you need to contact your doctor. Remember I said from grade two, um, where we need to switch one drug, NIMAR uh, nurses are able to identify a, a side effect, link it to a specific drug, then consider switching that drug after consultation with your doctor. However, if you are certified competent, which means you have been through the mentorship program, it is expected that if a patient uh, presents with rash, you should be able to say it's probably never rapid. If they've got three pluses of protein and their creatinine clearance is dropping, you should be able to say that's ten off of a. If they are coming with dizzy spells and a history of collapse and the HB is seven, you should say is that Zidovudin, you know, because if you are a competent Nimart nurse, there's a lot expected uh, from you. And uh, there's many uh, Nimart nurses who didn't do mentorship, but through experience, they have now learned how to manage um, side effects effectively. And you should be able to do that and advise also, you know, our families um, and so on. So there is a case study, which I want to explain to you. So this is a case study of Edzai. Edzai is 25 year old. She's a female. She presents for her four week monitoring. So she's now been on ARVs for one month. Ne? After she was started on a regimen that had tenofovir, lamivudin, and nevirapine. This regimen was started outside South Africa uh, at a clinic near a friend's home. She was told to report to a clinic when she arrived in South Africa. That's why she came to you. Ne? So during her two weeks, so remember now, this is her four week visit. So two weeks ago, she did not complain of any symptoms. She reported 100% adherence and knew everything about her drug, right? Then the nevirapine dose was changed to twice daily. Remember nevirapine, we start with daily dose. Nevirapine, 200 milligrams daily for two weeks. During the two week visit, we increased the dose to BD, so it was done. And during that visit, her ALT was 60, right? Was 60, so it was not very high. Remember from a NIMAR perspective, if the ALT is less than 100, and the patient does not have any symptoms, you can manage it. And how do you manage it? You tell me now, now, right? So today, this is now during the four week visit, she reports that she's adherent, she's taking her medicines as prescribed, but she's got a complaint of an abdominal pain, but she doesn't have fever, no nausea, no vomiting or diarrhea. You then examine her, you find that she's got tenderness on the right upper quadrant of her abdomen. There is no hepatomegaly or palpable liver. She's got minimal jaundice. Her eyes are sort of yellowish. Ne? And then her baseline CD4 count was 278 cells. Right. So what do you think is happening? Is there an indication to switch or stop a regimen? Eh? If so, what are your next steps? Hmm? My time for teaching ends here. Now it's your time. What do you think should happen, my dear uh, sisters? Let me, a uh, few seconds. Let me do this. 
I want to unmute you so that you can tell me. Actually, you can start typing. If you can type your answer, I'll be very happy. But uh, who wants to give it a try? Uh, you have this patient. You may raise your hand or even unmute if you want to try. Who wants to try? What do you think is happening and what do you want to do? Yes, you may unmute or raise your hand. Yes, uh, Leseho Mulele, you want to try? Oh, yes, I want to try. Um, no problem. Um, good evening to everyone. Well, I think what is happening here is that the patient does have toxicity of the liver. Okay. One. And she's admitted quickly. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, you said mm -hmm. the patient has toxicity of the liver. What are the things that you have picked up that make you suspicious that the patient has toxicity of the liver? Um, the, the patient has got minimal jaundice one, right? Okay, and yellow eyes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and again, the patient also... Uh, let me see... The pain? Yeah, the it's pain the as pain. well. The, yeah, the slight pain on the right upper quadrant as well. Yes. So that, that, that was my indication. That's, that's where I got it from, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. And maybe previously, because during the two-week visit, it seems like the ALT was high, but not too high, ne? But it makes mm, you suspicious. When yeah. you combine these three things, you're like, ah. Something is happening. Something yeah. is happening, yes, definitely. Yeah. Kalipa Numbuso, do you want to add? Kalipa, how? Now you balegging balegel. Who wants to tell me what is their plan? What's next? What do you want to do with this patient? Who wants to volunteer? You may raise your hand or unmute. Ah, uh, Lisa, you are back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. It's, it's just it's just me trying, right? No so problem. So what I, what I would do is actually stop what the patient is getting currently, the treatment that the patient is current getting currently, and do mm -hmm. the um, the tests. I just forgot what it was again. Mm -hmm. the, the the ALT test and whatever mm -hmm. test the the liver function test and to check mm -hmm. where, what what are we looking into because you said we don't treat um the the blood results but then the symptoms that the patient is uh, has at the mm. moment yeah i'm happy you got that message because that is the <laughs> message from this uh, whole exercise okay. we don't treat test results we treat pa we treat patients if you have a patient who's decompensating like okay. she does you know it might be slight jaundice but the thing is it's a symptom right mm, which mm. left untreated will become a big something issue. bigger yes mm. are you nimar trained no ah you are a natural <laughs> natural just 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 coming in just trying testing okay. the water <laughs> yeah 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 no 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 that's good i'm happy to 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 hear that so okay. let me uh, 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 show you a few slides that we which covered this specific topic so that you, 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 yes, right? Remember, I said in terms of yellow eyes or hepatotoxicity, um, most ARVs do cause it, but I said nevirapine is the biggest problem. And if, if you remember that patient now, the ALT is 60, so it's less than 100, right? So, so it means it's a NIMAR case, except that now you are dealing with a patient who is symptomatic, right? So our patient, unfortunately, has symptoms. So if you look at how you manage patients with symptoms, you have to stop all the drugs and refer. So Lesoho got it right, except that she wants to do the test. If you're in a hospital, you'll advise the doctor to do the test. But this kind of a patient, if the doctor is there in the clinic, maybe you ask the doctor to see the patient. If you don't have a regular visit at the primary care level uh, from a doctor, you need to refer them hopefully to an HIV clinic because there they will get a, a, a doctor who's experienced in HIV medicine. 
Um, and remember, you can the investigations to be done is to check if the patient does not have hepatitis B, abusing alcohol, abusing traditional medicines, and you can do your liver function tests um, at that point in time, right? So, so, so that is very key. So we had a patient here whose ALT seemed mild, but the patient was symptomatic. And sometimes you've got patients with high ALTs, but they don't have symptoms. So just remember um, um, that part. Then there's another key thing uh, which happened um, 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 with this patient. If I was to show you a bit from that case, just remember the rule, right, of HIV medicine. This CD4 count here, 278, right? You remember when I discussed the issue of rash and neverapine? Let me go back so that you can remember. I know it's too much to take in a day, but I'm hoping you will remember. I said it here. Neverapine toxicity is most common in black women with CD4 counts. Before, when you start ARVs, the CD4 count above 250, then I said 400 for males. So in, in other words, this patient from the start was not supposed to have been started on um, nevirapine, right? Because the baseline CD4 count was already high, right? And then during the two weeks visit, the ALT was already starting to go up and now the patient is symptomatic. So here you don't switch any drug, you stop the regimen, you stabilize the patient, you refer the patient for further investigation uh, by a clinician. If you're able to call your doctor before then, um, that is what um, you would do, right? Yes, so before I finish, just remember that those who would like to study with us, NIMART and other programs, dispensing, adult primary care, we are running a promotion. Um, you know, if you study with your friends, you will get very nice discounts. So do send us um, um, an email if you are interested and we take it from there. So let me read your comments whilst we are here. Um, so let's see. Uh, Sia says, uh, it's so sad that the most doctors mismanage patients, but uh, still we are told to refer patients. Uh, let me too. So none of my, not, but I make sure. No, I know. I know, Sia, what you are trying to say. Um, it's quite common. Like I said, when I kept on presenting to say it refer, but I know that some patients would be um, um, sent back to you the way you have referred them. Hence, uh, if you look at my talk, it has also empowered you to know um, what to do um, when it's needed. And then someone says, um, um, now I can be slightly out of tonight's topic. Okay, see, I want to ask something else. If a woman presents in labor, and has defaulted ARVs, do I treat her like a patient who has just, yes. So you, 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 you would, uh, if she has defaulted, she's not on ARVs and she's positive and she's in labor, uh, you would give her your state dose uh, TLD, tenofovir, amibudin, dolutegravir, and then with nevirapine uh, state dose, you, you would then start the child, I mean, treat the pair as a high risk uh, mother baby pair starting the child on prophylaxis, which is zidovudin and neverapine, dual prophylaxis, and make sure that the issues of defaulting and adherence are addressed before you, you discharge um, um, the mother. So what drugs uh, do you use? Well, let's use what's in the guidelines. Uh, you know, like I said, you would use uh, TLD together um, with a state dose of neverapine. I know private specialists like trying other things, but all the guidelines, whether internationally or locally, um, are there. Uh, Kola, you couldn't hear me. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I hope you finally got it. Nasip, what is teratogenicity? That is uh, the effect the drug might have on an unborn child. But like I said, the nevera, I mean, efavirenz is now safe to be used um, in pregnancy. Remember, dolutegravir should be used with caution in the first trimester, especially the first um, six weeks, right? Uh, and someone has answered, that is great. And someone says, suspected hepatotoxicity and needing to switch from nevirapine to efavirenz. So yes, you may switch, but remember, efavirenz can still give you the same issues. It's always best to switch to dolutegravir if the patient has a nevirapine toxicity. Um, 
um, is it, there is possible liver toxicity due to three noted? Oh yeah. So to you are answering to the case. Yes, you are. You are very right. Nevirapine should be discontinued as discussed with the doctor. Yes, but remember the patient is symptomatic, so it's always best that when you have symptomatic patients, you avoid um, some of um, 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 the drugs. You stop and you refer from a NIMAR perspective. Non, though you say you would stop nevirapine. Yes, if you feel if, if it's mild, but the patient is symptomatic, you are at the clinic, how are you going to monitor the patient at home? It's best to, even if you switch nevirapine, you still refer the patient to be assessed uh, by a doctor. Spongile says, you mentioned that you offer IMCI. I've searched on the website, yes. So IMCI is a public workshop. We will launch the e-learning or online version um, in the next week or two, Spongile. So you may do the e-learning one or wait for the public workshops, which were on hold due to COVID, but uh, we are back now with our public workshops. Right, thank you very much um, for your time. Are there any other um, questions or comments that you, you have before we summarize the session? Dr. Muriba, are you there? Do you have any comments? And then Andy Swa after that. Yes, Dr. Muriba. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, no. Okay, thanks for the for, for presentation. Uh, just a few pointers. Uh, but um, uh, because you are talking about side effects today, I just want to emphasize one point, especially those people, because we have different people who are working from facilities. Whenever you identify those side effects, you you have to report them to pharmacovigilance forms. And uh, there's an importance in terms of uh, reporting in terms of any pharmacovigilance forms, because there are a lot of drugs uh, that have side effects that we don't know, that even if those that you have discussed, but there are extras that you, you might discover while we are uh, still using them. So it's important to f fill the pharmacovigilance form to be able, always able to identify the other uh, side effects. Uh, we have discovered lots of side effects with the pharmacovigilance. I mean, you know, in terms of the emtricitabine uh, with the alopecia that they do, they do sometimes use and through the pharmacovigilance form. So it's important to to be able to have those forms, especially when you are, dead, you are working with patients with ARVs, to make sure that in your clinic you have the pharmacovigilance form. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Mdiba, for emphasizing the issue of pharmacovigilance, because that's where we learn more about the drugs um, um, as we go. So that is appreciated. And this is where uh, Golela Holela, you may unmute. And this is where. Okay, I have a question. Eh? Okay. I've seen one of the posts that was requiring an EMAT trained, but it uh, it was specific that the person must be trained in Cape Town. So since I'm in Cape Town, I'm worried now because I'm training right through by you guys. So <laughs> is it not? I don't know. <laughs> Look, uh, Andy, so people have preferences and Cape Town mm. out of all the provinces, I know it is one such um, a province. However, I can tell you that uh, from a school point of view, we have trained a lot of people um, throughout the country, including Cape Town. Mm. And they work uh, for different organizations, even the same Cape Town. So yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. these things do happen, but you know, with Cape Town, the state that might usually mm be the issue yeah but i think you can write to us directly to see how we can help you but otherwise i don't think okay. it's a it's a big challenge um All yes. right. All right. Yeah. okay thank you so much thank you princess okay. and then pulling after that then we close princess can you unmute princess are you there unmute your mic Oh, okay. Puleng? Yes, Doc. I just want to ask if I want to do a primary health care, will I be credited for also if I do a adult uh, primary care? Not really. It depends. So some universities like uh, the Northwest uh, University, they would generally 
um, expect um, their, their clinical nurse practitioners, I guess that's the outcome, um, to also mm -hmm. do adult primary care. So, but adult primary care is a national department of health program, um, which uh, is a requirement for all nurses who work at primary health care to complete. It's the same as IMCI, you know, um, and NIMART. But the, it's not meant to teach you um, to become a clinical nurse practitioner, because as a clinical nurse practitioner, you're sort of taught like doctors in terms of um, physical examination, taking history and making a diagnosis um, and so on. So these are not necessarily um, the same programs. I know they sound the same, adult primary care versus uh, uh, primary health care as a postgraduate um, okay. diploma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the okay. investment you're going to study. Yeah, sure. But it's a good oh, okay. program Thank to you. do because you would learn how to manage all chronic diseases, including emergencies and uh, um, pregnancy-related um, conditions. And we, it, it uses algorithms. And in Cape Town, it's a full requirement for you to work in primary health care. But I think also nationally, under the Ideal Clinic Initiative, it's a requirement. Yeah. Okay. Right. And with you guys, how long does it take? The other primary Well, we care? offer it online. Yeah, we offer it online. If it's a public workshop, we would do it over three days. Um, if it's an e-learning program, you have a maximum of a uh, of six weeks to complete, but the majority of our learners complete in seven days or so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what qualification do I get? Is it a certificate or what is it? It's a certificate, yeah. It's a certificate. It's, it's national a certificate or it's just normal certificate? Normal certificate as per National okay. Department of Health requirement. It's a normal certificate which uh, okay. also gets you some continuous professional development points, which is CPD points, yeah. Okay, doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Buleng. Yes, uh, Charmaine Sneiman. You may unmute, Charmaine. Hi, Doc. Hey, hi, hi, Hello. hi. hi. Ah, yes, hi. we can hear you. Hi. You can hear me. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm actually very, very uh, chuffed. I just uh, achieved my certificate through you guys. Ah. With the upgrade of the guide, you know, the, the HIV. Oh, the free <laughs> Yes. yes. So, so uh, listen, I just want to find out, I want to register for the NEMOT, right? Yes. And are you guys uh, 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 accredited to CETA? Yes, or we are. Okay. Yes, yes, I mean, I'm sorry, maybe you joined the, after we had started. So, yeah, so the, the, the simplest yes. answer is yes, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. So, no, no, because yes. I'm actually on the verge. I've been liaising with Mamusa. Oh, you know? Okay. No, we I are. I just want to. Is it? Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, and Thanks. I think we offer we offer the best e-learning experience in the country. So do give it a try and then come back and give us feedback. <laughs> no, I did. It's excellent, eh? It's okay. really, really excellent. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Shabane. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to having okay. you on board. All right. Oh no, I'm enjoying. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, guys. Hi, Dad. Yes, ma'am. Your Sorry last point thing, is. Yeah? Yes, Bulein. I just want to ask you if I do uh, adult primary health care, uh, care and with a uh, li uh, dispensing license, can I open my own clinic with that, with those certificates, just to manage chronic uh, diseases and other minor diseases? Yes, you can. You must do, okay. so let me tell you, you, you must also do IMCI because adult primary care, it covers mm -hmm. common conditions for adults, right? Yes. And then uh, IMCI, um, it will help you to manage all childhood conditions, especially for the under fives, which is very, very important, immunizations and all those things. And then dispensing mm -hmm. will make sure that you are a safe prescriber. 
And obviously, to function yes. independently, you need to have a dispensing license. So for us, we train you to get the certificate of, of competency for dispensing. Mm -hmm. Then you take that certificate, you apply with the National Department of Health for the license. Mm -hmm. Because this, these are two separate yes. processes. We train you, but the license mm -hmm. is issued by the state. Yeah. Y yes. yes. Okay, Doc. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, it's late. Thank you, guys. Thanks for, for, for taking time. I know this is family time, but you always make this hour to be special. Keep well. Bye-bye. Enjoy your evening. Bye -bye. See Good you night. soon. Bye. 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 Yeah, I like, I like bye. the buzz. Bye. Bye, doctor. Bye. 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 Bye.